So welcome to the Sense Making the Changing World podcast. Um, I'm here today with a, a wonderful friend of mine who I've known for many years now. This is Mariam Issa. And we're recording this conversation in the middle of Refugee Week. Uh, Mariam is the ambassador for the Refugee Council of Australia and an inspiring story, storyteller, community builder, community activist, speaker, um, author. And she's uh, founded a community garden in her backyard, which is one of the ways that I connected with Mariam uh, through the Permaculture Network. Mariam came as a speaker to the uh, National Permaculture Conference in Canberra a few years ago and her story absolutely inspired me and we became friends after that. She's come and stayed with me here at my place and I've gone and visited her down in her home in Melbourne. Um, Mariam herself was a refugee. Uh, she arrived in November 1998 uh, from Somalia via Kenya. I believe. Now, I really wanted to talk with Mariam on this podcast because our focus is around sense making in this changing world. And really, that's the core of what Mariam does. She helps us to make sense of what's happening. She helps us to find our inner strength and to communicate that with others and create spaces where that sense making can happen. And really, through her art of storytelling. And so, um, welcome, Mariam, to the show. It's so, so wonderful to have you here. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that through this conversation, you'll be able to help us to understand actually that we're all storytellers, because I think that's what you really helped me to identify that, that actually in the work that I do, I'm not just a permaculture teacher or gardener, I'm also a storyteller. And, and that communication, the way we communicate, the way we share our stories is such a powerful thing in, in bringing about positive change. Absolutely, Morag. And it's such a privilege and pleasure to always have these conversations with you. And I know that uh, Morag and I, when we see each other, it's sometimes we even find ourselves not, not, not um, ready to sleep. Like we can go all all the way into the night and just talk about um yes about life and making sense and i think as we talk as women especially um we are not only storytellers but we are space holders i think you know the women i'm very passionate about the subject of 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 you know bringing back the energy of women and feminine energy into this world and i think it is what is happening and the world that is emerging, I love uh, Arundhara Roy, a beautiful writer, a Pakistani writer. She said, um, a new world is emerging. On a clear day, I can hear her. I can hear her breath and I can feel it. So uh, the world that is emerging, yes, is a her. And I think for a long time, the world has been lopsided in the sense that uh, the female energy was absent or maybe we've let go of our reins, we've let go of our power. And, you know, for me to come back and become a storyteller, I think it was making sense of my stories. Coming to this country as a refugee uh, 21 years ago, I'm not a refugee anymore, but it's an, an, an adversity, coping with adversity and change has actually, that suffering has opened my heart and allowed in compassion. I think compassion one for self and compassion for the world that I live in. And so in that journey, I think what I recognized and what I, you know, uh, emerged for me is that I have let go of my power. I have been, you know, I come from a very patriarchal um, in, in, in culture, a uh, very communal culture. So in communal culture, it has its benefits, but it's also, um, it has its disadvantages. So in communal culture, you don't know much about yourself. You know yourself within others. And in, it is the Ubuntu culture. So it is, um, I am because you are. If there is no you, there is no me. So you don't really know that, individual side of yourself your preferences your you know you don't sort yourself out from others and so that can be you know uh it can it, it did have a big clash when i came into the western world because the western world was a very individual world a very you know um 
um, individual oriented and it was all it mostly was about me and my successes and what do I you know what do I get out of this and so I you know uh, I know that no one ever is anywhere randomly so I was placed even in 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 Australia when I came I was a very lucky refugee one I have to acknowledge that because we had a family here so we came through the family reunion and so that meant that we were um and and also we were processed offshore so that meant we came into the system and we were processed really easily and so where i started and in the house that i still live in to, is in a very fluent suburb affluent suburb in 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 melbourne uh, it's called Brighton, and it's also a very Anglo, very white suburb. And so when we first came, we, uh, we were at a very big disadvantage. You know, we were very black in a very white suburb and very poor as well in a very affluent space. So for us to be part of this community and to integrate into it was not easy job. And so that you know that discomfort that suffering it was an adversity on its own you know we were displaced you know for eight years before we came to australia but that was a chapter in itself and a phase of of disadvantage in the sense of being the refugee but when i came into the western world it was another phase of connect connecting to a community that knew nothing about you and that I knew nothing about. So usually as a storyteller, I say that, you know, um, culture is a currency. And if your currency is deflated, it doesn't buy you much. And even when I was given the currency or the trading currency at the time, I did not understand how to trade with it. So it was a really um, um, sloppy and very, you know, um, hard journey to begin with. So in keeping, you know, in the best thing I ever did in this time of, of uncertainty and time of really hardship was keep a journal. I was writing and I kept a journal. And as you know, Morag, my journal became a book and it's called A Resilient Life. So in that journal, I was getting to know myself. So I was not only integrating into a community, but I was also integrating within self. And the integration of self is the most important thing in our world if we can do it well. So I didn't realize at the time that the individual part of ourselves comes from our mind, you know, making sense of things and wanting to know ourselves as individuals. And then the heart is where the communal, you know, where the compassion, where it's not just about me and it's about, you know, the other. So if we cannot marry the two together, I think we are at a disadvantage. So that's what I learned through this process. I learned that I had four bodies. There was an energetic part of me. There was the heart space where the emotions live. And there was the mind. And then there was the physicality of me. And so to combine this, then I knew that once I had you know, I was looking and, and also because I was contemplating and I was looking inwardly and I was wanting to make sense of this new world that has emerged. So this is so perfect with your theme of, you know, making sense of a new world because we are at different phases and different, um, at different times in our lives. So we have to make sense of, of whichever world is emerging for us. And so the importance of storytelling in all this is i will demonstrate you know one day i was just you know um as a speaker and being called and asked to do stories and tell my own stories i became sick of telling my story you know and it was so hard and i was like oh my god i don't want to talk about myself anymore <laughs> you know and then one morning as i was you know i have a ritual of you know i i pray and then i i, I meditate I was actually literally shown the cross and at the top of it, you know, at the vertical line and the horizontal line. And I'm of the Islamic faith. I know nothing about the cross. So then I wanted to make sense of it. And in meditation, you actually, you, you either see a shape or something. So I saw the shape of, of the cross and I didn't know what it meant, but in making sense, I journal. So what, 
came up for me was that storytelling. And I was told that at the top of the vertical line is me, the teller. And if I looked at the bottom of that vertical line is the listener. So I was being shown my audience, that's the listeners. And then I was told to put a horizontal line on the vertical line. And then I was told that on the left of that line is the ancestry and where our store, you know, um, the elders come from. And then on the, you know, right of that uh, horizontal line is, is the youth and the future. So there is a past of the ancestry and the future. And then me, the teller right now, and then you, the listener. And then I was told at the intersection of this crossroads, there is the story. So that's where the story lies. And I was told that this story, and I, this is just something that in my imagination I'm making up. And in this intersection lies the grievances and the grace. Both grief and grace reside in the heart and in this space. And that is literally the heart of the matter. And as human beings, we are matter. So that's where it resides. And if that story, so I was then shown that that's not my story and it's neither the listener's story and it wasn't the ancestor's story and it wasn't the youth's story. It became our story. And that's how I felt then, oh yeah, okay, now I can tell the story. And then when I looked at it, actually I am telling my story, but my story is a collection of the stories of my ancestors. It is the collection of stories of the people that I have journeyed along, of the people that I live among. So I realized that within each and every one of us lives an incredible story, a story that comes from our lived experience, from the triumphs of our adversities, and from our daily joys. And in this intersection, in this space, we are actually sharing our story. And that's how the power that story has to move people because you relate. When I tell you a story, it, although you're born in the Western world, you've lived here, you will relate to my story from a very far world that you might never have you know, known. And that is the power so of of memory and imagination. So it, it's a powerful tool. So storytelling became a really powerful tool of rhythm and language. And because that language when used properly and used in a rhythmic and beautiful way, it has a way of moving us. Like songs, songs is stories. They can say, melt. Can you say a bit more about the rhythm? Like how do you... Yeah. Yeah. So even now, as we are speaking, you know, when people are listening, something in them moves, something in them, you know, uh, you know, it kind of shifts. So it has the power to shift and in shifting, not only for change, but for transformation. So I realized that, you know, life for me has been a safari. And, you know, a collection of, of, of stories and, and, and moving with, with these stories, but molding it and designing it and shaping it as, we, as I'm moving along. And so in, in doing so, then this becomes, you can then have that, your story in that. And you can own your power. But also it's in this platform, it is a platform that compels us, you know, it compels us for change. It, it, it calls for us to ask difficult questions. And when we ask these questions, you know, depending on the potency and depth of our asking, then that's where not only our experiences not only change, but they transform. And so we have that ability when we are holding space for each other and when we are using it as a catalyst for our grievances and then turning them into grace. 
So that is the power of storytelling. And every human being is a storyteller. Whether you're telling your stories through permaculture and, and, and gardens, or whether you're telling your stories through food, or whether you're telling your stories through drawing or through songs, it's this is who we are in this humanity. It is the human condition. So our stories is the human condition. It is our way of interacting and connecting and you know and 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 communicating so it's powerful and i do come from i'm very lucky in the sense that in i come from an oral culture which is really very rich in poetry and in 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 words so at a very young age you know my mother was a storyteller and she would just tell us simple stories for instance she was a craftswoman and she would be making, when she's, she wants to make a mat or something, she would say, oh, tell us, a, she will tell us a story. And she would say, it, it is a good idea, you know, to sit on your old mat when you're making your new one. And as she's saying that, she's sitting on her old mat. And then she says, because that way you see the patterns and the mistakes that you have made in your old one so that you can create your new one. But she would also add, don't be caught up, though, with your past mistakes or your future creation. Remember, you are the one sitting on the mat. You are the creator. So she would bring that us into presence. So that taught, uh, taught me that, you know, we are always working with memory and imagination at this intersection of presence. And that is so powerful. Mm. So I wanted to ask you about how you have helped to create space for that presencing, for that storytelling, for people to feel comfortable to share their story and, and to have that opportunity to transform, as you're saying, from, from grief to grace. Because a lot right. of people that you have come in contact with have come from a place of, of grieving, of, of trauma, yeah. Yeah. and that it's this this work that is is amazingly transformational and and those people are now being able to go out and and do amazing work in the world because of this transformation that they're having in these places that you create yeah and i i think yeah so we are all you know and this this our innovations or our creation comes from a place of really for need a place of um you know place our need to connect. I think as human beings, we have that need for connection. And uh, we have also the need for dignity. We need to be dignified as human beings. And sometimes um, when you are in a difficult situation, you might not be the one who feel, you don't feel the, the dignity, you feel a victim. So when you're in that space, you need people to, to dignify you. You need others to hold you. And so for me, when I came um, to the Western world, it was, you know, a very hard journey. And yes, I encountered a lot of racism. I encountered a lot of the other. And then I realized that I lived in different phases. I, I, I went into the phase of victimhood of poor me, that I come from a dysfunctional community. And, you know, I, because... You know, in my eyes, I saw that a whole system disintegrate in front of us. You know, our community go into fight, you know, civil war is the worst war ever, you know, when a neighbor can kill another neighbor. So that happened in my, in, you know, in my presence. And I saw that and I ran away from that. And then, yes, it, it gives you a kind of uncertainty where not to even, you know, it inhibits your trust as well in people. So how can you trust the total strangers when you couldn't even trust the people that you lived among? So that was where my, you know, my passion for the garden, for the community garden that I started, started from. And I realized that, you know, and I only did this work when I went through the phases. So when I went through the phase of victimhood, I came out of it and then went into a phase of anger, which actually is so much better than being a victim because then you can blame other people 
and you can prosecute and you can go this is you know um always make the you know see the worst in, in in others and then i saw that i was always going back and forth in these two dramas and then i realized look if i want a world that i want to call home what is it that I see? What is it that I envision? And this comes from a place of contemplation. It, it comes from a place of sitting in your, you know, in your old mat to, to make your new one. And I was like, I want a new life. And so um, Mahatma Gandhi's um, beautiful quote of be the change you want to see in the world supported me in this journey. And I felt, and also my mother's analogy of the mat supported me. And I felt, look, I need to create a new, a new world. And so I feel that's when I entered in my phase of empowerment, in the phase where I took power of my life and I wanted to make the world that I wanted to see. And so I wanted to work with women and I realized that women, as a woman, I had a, a, we take our war inside. And we kind of, you know, men take their war outside. All the wars that are being fed is fought usually come from men. Women's wars is the ones that diminish themselves. And, you know, uh, it either turns into a cancer or it turns into a, you know, um, something that you're always fighting and, and, and not being able to, to go to the aspirations that you want. So as I am having this, you know, this dream and planting this seed in my head, I was, the universe has an incredible way of, you know, being a way shower. And once you give, once you surrender and you allow yourself to be, you know, supported, everything comes into view. And then I did a permaculture. I was signed into a permaculture course. And while doing that permaculture course, I remembered, oh my God, you know, as an African woman, I actually don't know myself in closed spaces because I worked in community centers, I worked in offices and I was like, it didn't do anything for me. And then I was in a community, I was in the permaculture space and it was abundant and lush gardens. And I was like, wow, this is what I want. And so that's where my idea came from. And then I had a permaculture friend who was a designer. And then I came back home one day and I, as I was, because the, we were given homework and as I was doing my homework, I had a small veggie garden. And I started to plant these beautiful tomatoes and eggplants and, you know, cu um, um, cucumbers. And, and I saw that and I'm like, whoa, this is, it, it can happen. And then that's when I realized I want to invite people into my backyard, especially women. I want to bring them in. And so I wanted to register it as a not-for-profit organization. And then I had a dream one night and the name of the organization came in my dream. It was called RAW, R-A-W, Resilient Aspiring Women. And if you read RAW backwards, it is war. So in this space now, um, Fast forward seven years, we have uh, 38 fruit trees, 38 to 40 fruit trees. We have, um, we grow our own, you know, vegetables. But on top of all that, what we have put the love in the garden, every tree that was planted was adopted by a community member and has an intention behind it. Whatever intention that that person felt was missing in their world there was a young woman whose son was um had um autism and she said he wasn't accepted so she put her tree down as a tree of acceptance and she felt that we need to accept each other regardless of our situation circumstances and so that's we have the acceptance tree we have an abundant tree we have a trust and love tree so we have different trees which were put in by different people. And then we have the Rotarians built, um, pav, you know, pavilion for us. And so in the pavilion, we hold um, storytelling classes or just the storytelling circles where people just come and tell their stories. But we also have connected, we're connected with Storytellers Victoria, oral um, storytellers who come and tell stories of folklore or sometimes even, um, you know, um, 
normal stories. And then we have cooking classes. So we have so far cooked from more than 15 different cultures. And that is how beautiful our multicultural Australia is. So just in Melbourne, people from the community come and they say, oh, I'm from Malaysian background. I'm from Indian background. I am from a Somali background. I am from a Sudanese. So we've cooked about 15 different cultures. But even in that space of cooking, as we cook, we also tell stories. And it's a place where there is not, you know, what food actually does, it, it drops our guard. Our guard. And it's like, you know, we, we can be vulnerable with each other. So we've had incredible stories there. People have come and shared very intimately. And some of the stories really, um, it's, it's the human conditions and the atrocities that we can commit among each other. Because one of the women who shared her story was, she, went, she was raped by, I think, a gang. And imagine someone coming there and just, you know, that trauma, that story, and then sharing it. But if you saw that woman and the radiance and the beauty of who she is and the way she shared that story just uplifts you. And so that became a place where, you know, we can not only share our raw stories, but we can share with the stories that we've worked on to give, you know, um, meaning to give meaning and, and, and insight into, you know, into our stories. So I just just wanted to interrupt you there for a moment because this is all happening in your backyard. It's all happening in my backyard. It's a community garden. It's a community space. It's a community orchard. It's a community storytelling space, community kitchen, but it's all in your backyard. And I just reflecting on how you were saying that coming from where you were, where there was civil war erupting, it was hard to even trust your neighbours to get to the point now where you have opened up your home and your garden to be this space of connection and healing. It's really a a remarkable thing that that you're doing. And and it's not rocket science either, is it? No, it's not. And, you know, we we would jokingly, I started the community garden with a special friend. Her name is um, Katrina and she's from um, German background. She's migrant to Australia. But you know, and and very hardworking. They used to have a farm. And I think the work ethic of, we we actually joke that, you know, um, um, our garden is where the German precision meets the African chaos. (laughs) So we do need that precision and the chaos uh, in life. So, and, and it's just, there is no way we would have imagined or thought that's what my God, my backyard is going to look like one day. And it's, it, you know, and every three years, it becomes something different. You know, it used to be the resilient garden, but now it is a garden where we are seeding love. We call it um, seeding love through the community. And by that, we have the four letters, like eight, you know, um, eight meters tall letters of love. And we have an artist working with each letter. and we have been sponsored, each letter has been sponsored by a community member, a woman entrepreneur who, you know, um, accepted my vision because I do approach people and I ask, I ask people and, you know, um, I've become so bold in this journey that I bring people in and, you know, and that power of influence is also really amazing. And as a storyteller, I think you can, you know, you, be, you become an influencer as well. So I have had that privilege of people, you know, I approach people and ask for a favor and people say yes to, you know, incredible things. So that backyard has been invested by community over, its investment is over 100,000 now because we have a proper kitchen working the place has been built. The pavilion used to be, um, as you came, Morag, it didn't have doors and, you know, space. And now it has, you know, bifold doors. It's become really beautiful and we can use it now all year round. Fantastic. Before we used, we used it, how the elements, you know, allowed us because sometimes it would be too hot. Sometimes it's too cold and it's the bipolar of the Melbourne weather 
we, you know, yeah, we do used to have a really hard time to use the space, but now um, it's been invested in and, you know, it's just incredible what has happened. It's beyond my, you know, my imagination. I could never have thought that would be possible. That sounds amazing. I have to come and visit next time I'm down. When we're allowed to cross borders again. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I've also yeah. noticed that you, as well as working in the space in, in your garden and the storytelling that, that happens there, mm. you're also very much out in the community. You go and work with women's groups in different places. You, do, um, you go to schools. Um, there's also a centre that you're involved in that I noticed. Um, what's it called? Space to be, and yeah. and and also, and I'd love to hear a little bit more too about how you, what kind of work you do with more recent refugees and helping them to find their place in Australia. Yeah. So um, I, apart from the not-for-profit organisation, the Raw Garden that I run, and it's it, it is run by community as well. I have a social uh, enterprise, uh, enterprise. So I am an entrepreneur. And so I get to get, you know, um, the best job ever. You know, you, you are invited to places to, you know, different places nationally. I, I do a lot of national um, speaking and conferences. And so, yeah, I talk about mainly my journey as a refugee and, you know, um, the support and the leadership um and you know the economic part as well and you know allowing people to have dignity as well and you know um because there's an incredible potential that lives in people so don't see them where they're at but see them who they can be because someone actually pulled me up because they saw me they see my they saw my light before i did so, and we have that potential as human beings. Usually people don't see themselves. You, the mirror is the one that you know, see. So we are a mirror for each other. And I think, you know, that upliftment is really necessary and important. So I have the, you know, um, the incredible um, privilege of working with philanthropists, working with um, permacultures like Morag and, you know, and, and David Holmgren, you know, I've had an incredible journey with David as well. And, um, and uh, Nick Rose, who is um, from, from, what is his organization? Sustain Australia. Sustain, Sustain Australia. So Nick and I recently, uh, he's working with um, women of color who are starting their own small businesses. And so I've been supporting them in the mentoring section of, you know, sometimes um, women have this incredible potential, but they also lack that self-confidence and self-recognition um, for themselves. It's always they, they serve. They're really good at giving, but very bad at receiving. So I support um, women to receive. And I am also... Uh, a life coach so I wear that hat as well and I sit with people who want to deal with grief as well and then we go through three um, different um, processes and I give them tools to deal with their grief so that they can tap into their grace and then they can make sense of their future emerging world um, with space to be it is um, design and um, for, it was act, it is actually for refugees and asylum seekers, but it was also to bring in the main Australians, uh, mainstream Australians, so that people can co-work together. And in that space of co-working, I think they have an ability to give to each other. You know, sometimes we feel that we're helping someone or I don't even allow to use the word help. I think we are supporting each other. And what we are really doing is just reminding each other of who you are, you know. And when I'm so these days, actually, my activism is not so much as in like the drama space of being a savior, but I do what I love. And when I'm doing what I love, it is a demonstration. It is giving people permission slip to say that, you know what, I can do it, so can you. And so in, 
in, in doing what you love and being creative, I think you have the power then to light and ignite other people's light. And I, you know, my theme for 2020 was connection, creativity, and celebration. So I want to use these three, um, th these three powerful um, words to really connect and connect with self. So I have a really, um, um, I have, I have, a, I, I meditate a lot. So I have a ritual that I don't ever get out of my bed or my morning starts with real connection. Once I'm connected with self, then I know I can connect with the world because I want to leave the, what is left of my time now intentionally. And, you know, living intentionally means then you have to really focus and give your energy to something that you want to, you, you know, that will give, you know, something to the world as well. So it's not coming from just, ah, oh, I, I just want to be happy. No, I want to be happy with others as well, with my community and tap into that sovereignty that we have, that space of sovereignty. I think we are not yet understanding this sovereignty because I don't know and I don't think that a system that we have created can stop us in being who we want you know and sovereign comes from you know once you know what you want then it doesn't really matter everything just co coincides with itself and you know the garden i i work in my garden every morning i i i go half even if it's just half an hour to be reminded to really be reminded the garden and the earth is a reminder to us and to show us who we truly are, that we are interconnected, we're connected, we're not apart from it, we are part of it. So even if there isn't much to do, or even if I don't have time, you know, we, we do use this as, I think I don't have time is an excuse. We use it as an excuse. We have, you know, we don't have to be in the linear time. We can be in a timeless space. And the timeless space is the present moment. You know, any minute that you have, if, we, if you're truly connected, then it's just powerful because you will be looking at an ant and it will make, it will open your eyes in an incredible way. So the work that I do is very important to me, but it also gives me an immense joy. And I think when we are in joy, we create more. We really, we do. We create more and we connect more. And then we can celebrate those, you know, um, few things that we do. So um, I just had my, my 52, um, I'm, I'm I turned 52 this year and my birthday was on the 4th of June. And it was a Thursday, very humbling. You could, you know, a lot of people came to my home and, sending me flowers and, you know, bringing a gift and people just getting out of their way to come and visit me and say happy birthday. A friend called me and her husband, they sang happy birthday for me. And I was just like, whoa, this is just, I can't, you know, sometimes the, the joy just becomes more and more. So, and I think the more we talk about that, the more we create more of it. That's where our creativity and our creation happens, mm -hmm. you know. Don't talk about the things you don't like. Talk about what you love and what you like and you get more of that. I was just going to say too that, you know, that we're getting, because there's so much going on in the world right now and it's easy to get really distracted by yeah. all of that. And it's, yeah. you know, it's important to know what's going on and to acknowledge that. But we also do, as you're saying, need to imagine what is the world. So if not that, then what? Then and then, yeah. then recognise and celebrate each of those steps along the way that we are taking. We can quite get so caught up in, in the sort of determination of, of making change in the world, of, of being on this journey and being on this path, and we forget to enjoy and celebrate and relax and connect. And I think they're really powerful words mm -hmm. that shift how we inhabit this space of being change makers, and that and, so and and helps us to make sense of what we're doing rather than to feel in this this hurry and exact this angst that we hold about everything yeah. that 
yeah. really seats us in that, like you're saying, it's that in being in that present moment yeah. of, of being yeah. right here, right now, and being as true and as as authentic as we can right now and um, well, absolutely and i think morag we're becoming transformers i think for us now change happens naturally you know that is you don't even you change is happening all the time whether you like it or not you know we're changing in form we're changing in you know in we're changing all the time but what we're looking at in this time is transformation we are transform we want to transform our world mm -hmm. and um you know with change it's like we're always slow with it because we are you know still caught up in 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 what we want to make sense of but transformation means then it's something that is completely new it's something that we don't know but we're happy to you know to explore so we're explorers i think we're explorers we're mystics we're looking for mysteries we're looking for resolving you know um the we, we're here to have fun literally and i don't think that there is a world that needs to be saved i don't think so i think the world is in a good place we only need to reach it in the place that it is and once we transform and once we align with ourselves, the world literally around you changes. Mm -hmm. The people around you change, you know. Um, you see yourself not even being called to the things that sometimes you would have been necessarily. You see yourself letting go of the foods or some of the habits that you had. It happens automatically, but it's all it needs is for you to go in and tap into the grief and then catalyze it. You are a catalyst. That's what I tell people, you are a catalyst. And I think Morag and I know this very well. When you're working with compost, it really humbles you. It, it humbles you to understand the process of alchemy. You know, this very smelly stuff. It starts with not smelling in the beginning and you have all these different, you know, scrubs of vegetables and then you have this pile that really you cannot even sometimes swallow. It's so smelly and, it, and in the process you see the heat and the way it cut and then it becomes this beautiful soil that once upon a time, if someone, you know, you smell it, it's like, no, this cannot have smelled like, you know, poo or what it was smelling like before so you know gardens garden is the best place to humble yourself and to connect with self because then when you're digging you see you know oh, you see worms underneath you you see life underneath you and you go oh i cannot walk on earth i i have to walk differently now because i know that there is life under me so i think working from the brain and just going going has been our disadvantage i think once we come back into the heart the heart enables and allows you to see that grief and grace mm -hmm. and to see that story i have a question from my 14 year old daughter maya who she's wondering like how do you become a storyteller how do you find your story and you know i think she's really She's just started homeschooling again after being at school for a little while and she's stepping into sort of, she's exploring philosophy and, and permaculture and ways of knowing. And, and I think she's just trying to find a way that she can then speak out her story more. And uh, how do you encourage or support young people to be storytellers? To, to be storytellers. I think young people are naturally storytellers. Uh, but what happens is, you know, um, especially in the world, in the, in, in, in the Western world, there's a lot of destruction. There's a lot of um, things that call you. You know, as a young girl, I remember myself in, um, we lived in a very simple uh, village kind of. And, you know, there, were, there wasn't much destruction at that time. And my mother used to take us to the, you know, we had food forests and we, you know, so we would walk in nature and all that. But I think the power of storytelling and story gathering comes from um, connection with self. I think, you know, uh, young people have to come back 
to themselves. They have to ca- kind of find where their joy is. What do they enjoy? So does she enjoy writing? You know, let her keep a journal. You know, I would ask her to keep a journal and to start writing. So does she like writing? Does she like expression? You know, talking the story. Does she like drawing? Does she like? So it depends on how she likes to express herself. And, you know, she can choose all these mediums. It's, you know, it's, it is you know, um, when she's expressing, she has a mirror. Just go in front of the mirror and express. You know, do you love dancing? Dancing is a form of storytelling. It's when your body moves with the rhythms, it tells you something. You know, some parts of you move that want to move. And so it's just experimenting with that. And words are like that. So when she wants to tell a story to her friends, yeah. Yeah, she has to be in practice. Create an audience. You you know, whenever you're told to tell a story, don't shy away from it. Sit in the discomfort. You know, the place where the story is, is where the discomfort is. Sit at the intersection. And when she sits there in that space of, um, you know, of, 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 um, it's a sort of a grieving kind of, but it's also the space of neutrality as well. You come to this space of neutral. You're not excited and you're not also frightened. And you come to this space of neutrality. And this space of neutrality, then you can understand what calls you. So you, she can find that space in meditation. I think it's really important for quiet like meditation doesn't have to be just sitting down and meditating it can be walking it can be you know uh being silence a lot of silence so turn off the distractions whatever those distractions are and create a forum or a space where you can share your stories and the more you talk i think the more you will realize and the more you know what you're saying because you know uh, there's a lot of swearing and, and people use a lot of, you know, different kinds of words. And words have vibrations. They tell us what we feel. You know, when we use a swear word or you use a certain word on someone, you feel it actually. What that word, the potency of that word and what it can do to the other. So as a storyteller, actually, you're not only an entertainer, but you're also a placeholder for others to feel connected, but to also feel, you know, compa- you, know, you have compassion for them. So I'm very particular with the words that I use with people. Mm-hmm. I like what you words know, and, I, and I really like that you're saying that sit with that discomfort and, and just start sharing because it's not about trying to work out your story all by yourself. No, your story no, right. happens in yeah. relation and, you, and in that response when you say something and you, and you feel something happening and then the story evolves. And it, like, I think you said that before, that our stories change and transform over time. It's not like we have this fixed story that's our story. Our story yeah. only exists in relation to others and it's always changing because we're always in relation to new new experiences, mm-hmm. new people, new environments, and, and it's this constant, change is constant. It is constant. Well, the change varies, but change, <laughs> things are always changing and our story is always yeah. changing and practising. And, well, one uh, thing as well, Morag, that I, I share with youth of, um, you know, of the Somali descent, their poetry of the African descent, very oral cultured, you know, in our oral traditions, it's, it's cultural, um, it's, it's oral. And, I ask them, you know, because as storyteller, we are channelers, we're channeling energy. And so our ancestors, actually, in our African culture, we say that, you know, um, there is no death. There is a continuation of life. So your ancestor, although you don't see their body and their form, they exist in energy. And sometimes they can come through and you can channel them. And your stories can be an anger of, an aunt who passed away, you know, years and wants to take revenge on someone and it might not even have anything to do with you. So I listen to their poetry and it sometimes is very, it comes from a place of anger and it wants to, you know, to, 
it's like a bomb. It's, it's, it's there to really, you know, it wants to kill. And I'm like, this is not yours. When did you even see, feel all this heart? You know, but it, they bring the grief of the ancestry into this platform. And it, that's what's happening in our world. You know, what is happening in the world is the wrongdoings, is the grievances that has happened. And we can't resolve that until we realize that we want to move away from it. We want to transform into a new people. So the people who have done, you know, the oppressor and the oppressed, you know, are again, the end of one stick. They just both hold the end of one stick. And one can feel guilty of the grievances of guilt and one can feel the grievances of shame. And when these two people come in the same place, those are very heavy energies that cannot, you know, we can't go past them if we want to create change. So we also need to see the, you know, the, the, the heaviness of the words that we use. Do we want to be uplifters? Do we want to be healers? Um, do we want to love each other? Or do we want to hold these grievances for the rest of our, you know? Yeah, because that's what has been happening. You know, we have been carrying it from generation to generation. Is it time now that we stop that and move with an understanding? Come to a space and say, I hear you. I feel you. I am sorry if you are from that, you know, end of guilt space. And this person to genuinely, because when you say I am sorry genuinely, the other literally loves, let's go of, let's go of the grievances. Mm. But because we are not quite there, we want to make change from outside, you know, mm. and so the power is in compassionate storytelling and compassionate conversations. Yeah. In listening. So the first, you know, um, space is to listen to each other. Because if you can't hear the other, you don't even know what their grief, their grief is. Mm. Oh, my gosh. There's so many rich messages and stories in, in what you've just shared with us. And, I, you know, I think, I think many people might need to listen through this quite a few times to just allow that to, to sit. because you know, there's so much in what you've just said that is um, really important to hear. And I just would yeah. like to maybe sort of bring our conversation full circle as, as we bring our conversation to a close, um, going back to, you know, the fact that we are actually in um, Refugee Week right now. And yeah. is, is there something that you could uh, suggest as a, as a community here in Australia um, in particular that we could be doing more to support refugees, to feel more welcome? In what way can we shift this? What, what way can we support the transformation? Yeah, so the, the refugee theme this year um, is welcome. And, and how can we welcome people uh, more into, into these spaces? And I think it's, you know, one, you know, my mother used to say, you know, if you can host someone in your heart, you can host them in your home. So the first place of hosting and the, pl the first place of welcome is the heart. So to feel uh, for this, even if you're not doing anything, if you're just feeling in your heart that, you know, they, this is a world that is changing and putting yourself in the space of the other, because the other is just a mirror of you, then naturally that's, um, you have already taken a step forward. And then the second one is then everyone knows what they can do. What can I do as an individual? to support refugees, to support people who are seeking asylum, but also people in general, like how can I not be stingy with love? How can I give more sm smiles? How can I be kinder, you know? And so respect and kindness and, you know, 
in, 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 in trust that you can do it. I think sometimes we don't even trust ourselves in the spaces that, because the coronavirus has also allowed us to show us a bit of what being a refugee actually really means, you know, to be just disconnected from the whole world and to be put in this, you know, um, space on your own without, you can't, you know, yeah. So we do know what it, you know, in the context, however small your context or big it is, we've, we've seen a little bit of that. So being from the heart. And then the, the, the second one is hosting them in your home. Yeah. How can you host, you know, because this Australia is your home and how can I be more of a host in this space and what can I do? So there are a lot of refugee um, activities and and, and things that are happening you can go to the the website of refugee council of victoria but also the refugee uh, week and once you go to that website there's a lot of things and directions and things that can be done but more of, become more of a host yeah yeah than- great thank you and and if people want to find out more about you and your work and to invite you as a speaker or find out how to access your book and all of that where do they go to find that Marion? so um my organization is called mariam isa pty and i do have a website mariamisa.com.au and um the work that i do uh through that platform is with my daughter and we call ourselves uh, intergenerational story inspirers. So we go to schools. Uh, she goes to schools. I don't go to schools anymore. But I do invite schools to the garden. Uh, we invite, um, we're just starting corporate dinners uh, in the backyard as well. And we will be inviting corporates and t- uh, in team building and in connecting with, with um, communities. So I've always been in that at the intersections. Of, of difficult conversations and I l- love to build the bridges and invite people into uh, different realities because you know although we do live in this big world as a one big world there are bubbles in it and we all occupy different bubbles at different times so it is very important that we know of each other and we cherish our diversity and connect with each other more so this is for me as i see it is a world that is calling for love and i love rumi's quote and he says do not look for love because you already are love look for the places that you're withholding love so that and 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 he also adds let what you love be what you do and so whatever you do as your career choice or you know um if you are even a mother at home with your children love it i mean it's just to bring love to the places that you withhold it from the places that hurt and that is you know that's most of the work that i do so yeah you will see a lot of my work in mariamisa.com.au well thank you so so much for sharing your morning with us today as part of this um, refugee week but also just to be you know also to be part of this the ongoing conversations around making sense in this world and and the storytelling is such a powerful part of that and like I said at the start too when I first met you and I heard you speak I saw something in myself about being a storyteller too, that just opened up a whole new way of seeing and being. And I hope that as people have been listening to to this conversation too, that they're also feeling in themselves some of, some of that potential as well. So thank you oh, so absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for this invitation. And it's always a pleasure. Lovely to have you on the show. So thanks for tuning in to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast today. It's been a real pleasure to have your company. I invite you to subscribe and receive notification of each new weekly episode with more wonderful stories, ideas, inspiration and common sense for living and working regeneratively. And call positive permaculture thinking and design into action in this changing world. I'm including a transcript below and a link also to my four-part permaculture series, really looking at what is permaculture and how to make it your livelihood too. So join me again in the next episode where we talk with another fascinating guest. I look forward to seeing you there.